Some applause for Paul, please. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Bruce, like you said. I am from a company called Smart Bear Software. We do uh, quality tools for the connected world. And what, what I'd like to do today is, um, I'm, I've got a separate workshop uh, later on in about uh, an hour with uh, our friends from Sojeti in the UK. There are services uh, in the UK, one of our partners. And what I'd like to do is uh, spend a little uh, non-technical time talking about some of the uh, overlap between uh, the hot stuff called DevOps and financial technologies, and then also um, how that wraps around into APIs. Uh, I'm also going to use an analogy, uh, sparring, sparring lessons, because um, I actually just started karate about two or three months ago, and uh, it's because my daughter does that. And so I'm starting to learn very early lessons, just like we're learning our early lessons uh, in this space. So that's where that comes from. Not working. Oh, here it is. So that's me. That's where you can get me on Twitter. Um, I've also got a booth out there, and uh, by all means, um, do so. So aside from my children at home, these, these are my children uh, at, at SmartBear. Um, they are API testing and service virtualization tools. Uh, Ready API is a platform that allows you to test pre-production, do uh, functional testing, also take that and do load testing, and then do service virtualization on top of that. And we've uh, actually, a couple months ago, we released a security product as well. Um, SOAP UI, on the other hand, uh, just a show of hands, who's, who's familiar with SOAP UI? All right, <laughs> I love that. I love seeing that. I love seeing that um, because I started working as the marketing manager after a while uh, working as an engineer, and then before that, uh, 12 or th 13 years now, being a developer. So I come from the tech area and I've moved into marketing because I think there's a gap uh, between the geeks that sit behind a desk and the people that make business decisions. And the less of that gap, the better in the world that we're moving to. Um, SOAP UI, when I look out at a world like this, by the way, this is a brilliant view. <laughs> Um, when I look at, at the world that we live in, uh, I see all sorts of things that we're building, and it's staggering. It's absolutely staggering uh, how much we build and how much we connect together, and that matters to me. Um, I think about I think about my friends. I think about my family. I think about uh, businesses and the way that they connect in together. What kind of experiences are they expecting? I mean, it's like, it's, it's a bad day if you can't use the ATM. No big deal. And that information wasn't accurate. That's a pretty bad, bad day for me. So we've got these tools that make sure that those systems work. And, you know, SmartBear builds the tools. We don't do the testing. <laughs> That's up to you. You're the ones that are building the software. Uh, and the one half of it is building it. The other half is making sure that it's meeting not just technical goals, but business goals. So when I look out at financial technology, I see, um, if I could boil it down to three things, I see a whole bunch of experts. I mean, I, I want to be clear. I, I'm standing up here, and there's plenty more expertise in this room that, that I could ever hope to achieve on, on my own personal self. You guys are experts in your fields, both in the business development, in the strategy, as well as the technical architectures. Um, so. You guys got that down already. Uh, there's also a lot of entrepreneurship that's going on here. People who are really looking to bring an experience that changes, fundamentally changes, um, the way that we do business, the way that customers perceive their own finances, for that matter. And I would also say this, this compared to some of the other sort of topics that we've been rolling through over the past five years, uh, I've been doing that around APIs, um, different industries, this is a very engaged industry. Uh, this industry is very quick to figure out problems and provide solutions. Um, and uh, what was it? Um, it was VLab. I was watching a VLab, uh, and it was in April of this year. Uh, Jake Quintus, the uh, CEO of, of <coughs> Level, he um, he said, "It's not okay to bring a 
beta product into the fintech market to that effect. And I, I completely agree. Um, we deal with challenges in this industry, we deal with challenges um, that I don't think the, the startup culture from, from Silicon Valley has quite necessarily gotten to yet, uh, the DevOps culture for that matter. Now, speaking of DevOps, um, I can't believe I'm using the term. Sometimes people get so tired of hearing the same terms over and over again, but there's something to this one. It's a big deal. Um, instead of just a textbook example, what I see is out in the field, the way that our customers at SmartBear are trying to rapidly iterate, and we've got customers in all verticals. We've got healthcare, uh, we've got, I mean, just look at some of the law, the tall buildings around here. Um, and what, the, what they find is that putting this stuff into practice is actually rather difficult. Um, you've got cultural challenges, you've got all sorts of technical difficulties, but when it comes to uh, adopting new, new concepts in DevOps, for instance, um, boiling it down and, and thinking about not just the technical definition of what it is, like continuous integration or delivery, it's actually uh, <coughs> bigger than that, much bigger than that when it comes to how the business functions, um, how the teams are able to do what they have to do, what is required uh, from a cultural and from a personal uh, uh, commitment to a new team structure, just for that to be able to function. So for me, defining DevOps, it would be uh, m very quick iteration. That's one of the key definition um, topics in, in that space. Uh, being able to rapidly iterate, I mean, I'm not talking about like two week sprints, I'm talking about like one week sprints. Being able to fit all the aspects of de design, development, implementation, uh, orchestration, testing, in a one week sprint, is, is absurd. It's also very, very necessary. Um, and so they have quite a few things that they've done from that space that help them iterate faster. Uh, they also deal um, well at the, one of the requirements of DevOps is to collaborate, to be able to actually work with multiple teams and to be able to take people who are only focused on metrics, let's say the operations people, and making sure that that, that final pass of success is meeting business goals to the people who are maybe very down in the weeds and busy with, uh, with code implementation. So that collaboration is, is one of those, uh, the outcomes of dev and one of the fundamentals at the same time. And then also automation becomes really hypercritical, being able to do uh, uh, quick deployments using tools like Puppet and Chef, um, Ansible, to be able to do this stuff very quickly for each of those aspects of the life cycle, the software life cycle, from design to QA or testing to, implementa to implementation and deployment all the way out into management. Um, DevOps is very focused on numbers. Metrics tell what, we've, what we should prioritize all the way back in the development phase. And so uh, financial technology, DevOps, um, we have some shared goals here. Uh, fast, cheap, and then also good. These are three things that uh, are in what's called the designer's triangle. Uh, who's, who's ever heard of that? You know, good, fast, cheap, come on. I mean, it's a, it's a proof, okay. So um, when it comes to good, what I mean by good is software that actually meets the goal. A quality piece of software isn't just one that has, uh, that doesn't have any obvious bugs in it. Um, even a 100% free, bug-free system might not actually meet the customer's goals. And so, is it good? You know, if a mobile app doesn't do what I thought it would do because it said something else, that's, that's to me, that's a problem. So that good and quality aspect is important. Um, speed, not just how fast the app is. I mean, here's another question. How many people have uninstalled a mobile app because it was slow? A lot of people do that um, simply on the premise that I don't have a lot of time. So uh, something as ephemeral as a mobile app it might be very important. Um, it, you know, it might be a banking app for that matter. But there are other ways to do this, and you're only a swipe away, honestly, um, if you're not fast enough. But then also fast by speed. I also mean time to market. So again, it might be a super fast app, but if you cut out some of the aspects of quality, now you're focused on a product that will make it to market on time, but maybe
maybe it won't satisfy the goal. And so making it on time is also important as well. And then low cost. Uh, low cost has to consumers and providers as well. It should be low cost to you. It should also be low cost to the customer, uh, to, uh, or a low bar of entry at the very least, whether it's Freemium Pro or whether it's you know a paid subscription, whatever. That should be relatively low cost to allow people in the door so that they can find the value and then want more from uh, your products. And so the other part of the designer's triangle is this paradox that says, well, you can't have all three at the same time. Pick two. What are you going to do? Is it going to be good and fast? That ends up being relatively expensive. You pay a lot. And you might not necessarily know that it's going to meet the goal. Um, so you, you get something out there. And you realize, whoops, now we have to re-engineer it. Uh, now we have to rethink our strategy. So you have to go through that all again. And you're probably going to pay twice for that for the next iteration. Um, cheap and good usually produces slow. I know this uh, pretty well when it comes to uh, my background in load testing. So if you use um, remote agents or you use resources in a load test that are the cheap solution, you might not get the best quality from that load test. You might have actually problems getting that off the ground. And if you use really high quality cloud services, let's say, um, that then you're paying for it a bit. And then the final one, and well, of course, fast and cheap. Who wants an inferior product? So these are the standard ways that this fleshes out. And I don't think that financial technology has that luxury. I really don't. I think they play by different rules, um, the, the considering compliance, considering partnerships and integrations. You don't just, like Manuel says, you don't just break stuff. You can't do that. Um, so what this means to me, though, going back to what it really means when I go back home, is that we have some big problems right now. Uh, we have a financial literacy problem in that we can bring products to market that make it really easy for people to do things. But we have to do that. We absolutely have to get the average expectations over how people manage their own finances and how they're able to transition from, uh, from level to level in their understanding about how to make good and how to provide value for themselves and what to expect from financial technology to be able to pro provide that value to them. And then also confidence, being able to have a confident outlook on your future. Uh, that is also something that I think is a huge challenge that financial technology can solve. Um, also, finally, financial value, what it means to actually put your money somewhere as opposed to something else or put it somewhere else. That, to me, seems to be some of the key things that financial technology, that the fintech startups can actually solve. They play by these rules, and these are not, these are very serious rules to play by for people, for individuals for families, for businesses, small businesses, and large businesses. And that's, that's what that is, is that I don't think we have the luxury of saying we can't do all three. So this, fortunately, is a unique opportunity where financial technology can take some of the lessons from DevOps, um, how to get fast, how to, how to speed things up. They can take those lessons and work through compliance and integration considerations. And yet, I still think that we have to solve this by actually doing some stuff. We can't just um, sit back and talk about it like we're doing right now. We actually have to implement. We have to try different methodologies, um, not just what types of technologies we use, but also methodologies in our business practices. Um, so uh, my premise was things that we can learn from each other. Uh, when you're sparring with somebody, it's not just like you're trying to hit them. It's not just like they're trying to hit you. Uh, who, who, who has done a martial art or some kind of you know, pair, uh, pair sport before? All right, OK. So in that pair sport, while you're doing, you're learning yourself, and you're also learning to respect the other person. You're also learning how to uh, learn from their successes and their mistakes as well. That's actually what this, this was about. This is a Japanese writing that basically says, out of failure, you can learn great uh, how to succeed out of an unanticipated situation. Um, the unanticipated situation is that, yes, success can come from some failure. Um, but we have to bound that failure. There's always going to be bugs. Uh, it's just a matter of how to minimize those and reduce your risk at the
the same time, you're baking back those lessons into your business practice. So when it comes to lessons that we can learn from the DevOps movement, uh, the first one is, of course, attainable goals. Very short, very concise. This is what the whole one or two week sprint thing is all about. Um, if you take, uh, if you think about uh, an, an older classic model of like releasing software every three or six months or, or longer than that, what you're doing is you're basically saying, I, only, I can only prove that I was on the mark when it came to my, what, what I thought my customers were looking for every so often. I don't think, I don't think we want to do that anymore. I mean, as an industry, as a culture, as a technology culture, I think we need more and more tests involved. And so, fortunately, DevOps um, gives us an answer there. Just keep it short and sweet. Do less more often. And then what you're doing is instead of like having to course direct, uh, redirect every X number of months, you're doing very small little changes that help you ensure that you're on the right track. So those minor, those minor rollouts, you can monitor and confirm. The other benefit of rolling less out more often is that instead of delivering a package of a lot of functionality that, that may or may not uh, need to be quality uh, tested, you can actually do minimal testing. Um, you, you, can, you can minimize the total amount of testing that you have to do just to make sure that that new stuff is successful. And then again, the motions in operations to monitor how successful that was. Did it break? Uh, did it actually increase revenue or decrease revenue? New feature, is it working well for people or is it not? There are much less questions per iteration. Um, there's also, uh, they get their pipeline down really well. By pipeline, I mean going from an idea down to some code, to some testing, to some rollout, then all the way into monitoring. They know that getting that pipeline completed and ready and streamlined so that you can put a good idea in and get results out at the end. Getting that pipeline down is, is critical. They also are willing to change. Okay, so something's not working. Let's, let's rearrange that. Now that does run the risk of a little bit of a cultural, um, cultural things. Uh, some people don't always want to change and some people don't <coughs> always have the luxury to change. But this is one of those lessons I think um, anybody can learn. Uh, lessons from financial technology to DevOps. Um, now, I'm not talking about the strict DevOps uh, canonical definition. I'm talking about in practice, what do we see people doing? Um, I've seen enough of the stickers on laptops that say, screw it, ship it. We don't, that doesn't fly. That doesn't play well when it comes to my money. <laughs> so um, we can't do that. Uh, we, we have to be able to uh, evolve the concept of being able to do rapid iteration without necessarily dragging in this uh, laissez-faire attitude of, eh, we'll monitor it later. Monitoring is not enough. It's certainly not enough for the financial technology, but it's not enough for anybody who wants to roll out something the right way the first time. Um, then also, you can't wish away previous implementations. There's plenty of people who are just figuring out their service-oriented strategy We'll talk about that in the workshop that we're doing with Andrew here with Sajeti in about a half an hour. Um, you cannot, if you've got services like ESVs uh, in your infrastructure, if you've got SOAP uh, involved in that, if you're trying to launch a REST of services on top of that, you're, it's a mix and match of not just technologies, but also um, historical concepts. Uh, the concepts in the old SOAP and SOA mentality is not the same as things like the RESTful, and then even further than that, microservice mentalities as well. <coughs> so you're gonna have to be able to merge those together um, and have a team be able to collaborate about that. Um, the other thing is uh, quality matters to everyone. By everyone, I mean everyone in the team, everyone in the business, all the stakeholders, your customers, quality matters. When you ship a bad product, people will not use it. So the last thing I would say is there is motion. There's plenty of motion here. Um, it's you have the opportunity to move <coughs> so quickly, um, and you and and from what I can tell, compliance and regulation is also the purview of that movement. Meaning that 
you have the opportunity to affect that. You've got things like Project Innovate that help you um, not only get your stuff off the ground, but help translate to the more complicated uh, compliance and regulations uh, what is actually going on in the field. So you have a unique opportunity to change what is being told to you um, that has to go on in order to be successful. Uh, you also have uh, the opportunity to work on strategy, to actually get it right, um, starting with strategy. So the strategy is good. It's good to have a, a plan in place from top level down that includes both uh, the business goals that then trickle through to the, uh, the decision makers, the um, management, and then also down to the implementers, the people who are writing the code that will eventually get out to customers. And customer feedback is so critical, not just from the metrics on a dashboard, calling people, talking to people, being at these kind of conferences, and getting a real read on whether your stuff is actually meeting people's needs. That's important. And I would say help is already here. This conference is a fantastic place to network, but then on the other hand, you get to see all the vendors that, you know, yes, there's products involved, but there's also people who want to help you get this right. And I would say I want to help you get this right because it's affecting me, it's affecting my family, it's affecting my friends. So that's about it. Um, I just wanted to encourage you. You got a really unique circumstance, and SmartBear really uh, has an opportunity to help you here with quality, with your software quality. But in the meantime, thank you so much, and uh, good luck. We have time for two questions. Um, it's scratching on me. <laughs> uh, I have one question for you about the. Uh, you know, thanks to Docker container and the container movement, uh, we've seen some press releases on TechCrunch, some like big corporation and banks, some banks like release 300 times a day code, right? Uh, and it was like nine months before and for releasing code and now it's like 300 times a day, so and they are proud of it, right? But the thing is that uh, we received in API Days Australia, we received someone from uh, the old developer for Tunisia like a space, space program, and he said like, we were building software for 40 years, because when it's up in the, in the, in the space, like we cannot move, like yeah. he told that changing one line of code was a three month decision, and his line of code he applied was not, it was non-critical, non-mission critical code, right? Three months, and it was not accepted. So his line, when you work on one line of code and it's not accepted, so. But now with, it's true that startup culture develop things, uh, you know, push to, more and more. So my question now is that for big corporation that wants to build for a long time, for uh, and, and you talk about it like how they should you know, have this DevOps culture and how they sh should also like not go into the bad side of it, which is like being lazy, being lazy with designing code that that stay forever that doesn't break for the the, the user, the app developer, and the customer. Well, I see it as a spectrum. Um, in my conversations with customers, again, um, right now I'm serving as a marketing manager. Who knows what a marketing manager even does? One per two, two people. Facebook, That's Facebook great. ads, right? That's great. So um, a lot of my time is devoted to a lot of my time is devoted to actually talking to people and getting the story uh, back to the people in my organization in a way that really affects change. Um, when I talk to uh, my customers. Ownership over that. I love them. Um, they uh, there there are all kinds of stories. People from those kind of you know highly uh, there's a lot of bureaucracy here and people aren't willing to change, all the way up to people who are in these fast iterative cycles. And so I see it as a spectrum uh, or a continuum of where where do you want to move the needle um, and why do you want to move the needle. You gotta uh, get back with your primary business objectives. That is the ultimate goal. And from my perspective, and, and what I see as most successful, is you make your customer and their customer view uh, how they actually, why they use your software, it's because of something specific. So if you can take the customer as the most important thing to flow through, that experience to flow through to your business objectives and your goals, then also you'll be able to figure out on what part of that spectrum do I want to move the needle for maybe this project versus that project. So obviously space travel, kind of really important to get everything right, um, and that's been going on for a long time. So they've got the, the massive amount of old systems that they need to handle, you know, uh, the firmware 
you, know, you need to be able to ship firmware out of the space that can accept changes uh, over time and be able to handle those updates. But when it comes to you know a SaaS product that you don't know if it's going to be around for, for uh, like six or twelve months later, uh, then it's up to you to figure out exactly you know well you know we can decrease the quality a little or we can introduce a little risk, but it has to come because we have made a purposeful decision to do so because it's so necessary to get something out faster or vice versa. We need to crank the dial differently to say, no, we've seen enough where people are not satisfied with this. We need to increase the quality and decrease the speed a little if that's what you're suffering under. But again, you can find ways to resolve that. Automation is resolving a lot of that QA stuff for us. That's why we're in the tool business for automation. It's because it's one of the number one things that can get people a lot faster without really having to, to necessarily deal with those cultural changes per se. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's answered the question. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you.